Welcome everyone. Thanks for coming again this evening. It's great to be together and worship the Lord together. Let's open with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we come into your presence to celebrate that there's power in your blood. There's power in the name of Jesus. Lord, it's really amazing the extent to which you have forgiven us and included us in the victory that is in Christ. And so we're just here to celebrate, to remember, to worship, to say you are our God and we are your people. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit will lead us. In Jesus' name, amen. Our call to worship tonight is from Psalm 139. O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. God knows every detail that we have and yet we don't have to hide anything from him because he's provided the remedy. And so we call out with the psalmist, Lord, lead us in the way everlasting. I invite you to stand and sing together, cleanse me. Can be seated. Let's pray for this evening's offering. Our Father in heaven, we thank you. Um, just as you have blessed us with so many good blessings, Lord, every good thing we have comes from you. And Lord, tonight we want to worship you with our gifts and contribute toward Appalachia. Reach out. Lord, we pray that you will use this money and bless the outreach. Um, that takes place in that region of our country. 
that the gospel will go forth and people will be discipled, that hope and healing will come to people in that region. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me invite the deacons to come forward for tonight's offering. So what have you learned so far in this study? What difference has it made in your life? I'm a child of God. Very good. I'm not condemned. Wonderful. Someone else. I'm a saint, not a sinner, right? That's important how you view yourself because our actions always flow from what we believe about ourselves. Anyone else? Say it again. I'm forgiven. Very good. Yeah, we started with some of these core truths about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Uh, For us to walk in freedom, to walk in victory, we need to see ourselves the way God sees us. Our actions, I mean, our identity doesn't come from what we have done. It comes from what Jesus has done for us. Our identity doesn't come from what other people say about us. Our identity comes from what God has said about us. And we need to make a choice to believe that. And then a couple weeks ago, we started to look at the enemies of our soul, so to speak, the the things that try to pull us away from God's truth. And we saw them in the Heidelberg Catechism, the devil, the world, and the flesh. Um, In our study, we started with the world. The world paints a false picture of reality, though it's a complete picture, and it promises to meet our deep God-given needs for significance, for acceptance, for security, but of course, the world fails to meet those needs. And we, we overcome the world by replacing our old beliefs and values and our old ways of thinking with God's truth. And we looked at Romans 12, 2 that night. Don't be transformed. I'm sorry, don't be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then last week we looked at the flesh, um, that, that bugger that doesn't want to leave us, right? <laughs> the flesh, it's these old patterns of living, these old ways of thinking, but we also saw the truth that we have been set free from sin. Sin no longer has power over us. We're not slaves to sin any longer, and now we have a choice to make. We can live according to God's truth, or because we're free, we can choose to sin, but we're no longer slaves to that sin. And knowing that helps us to choose 
to do what's right in God's sight. And tonight we're going to look at that third enemy that tries to pull us away from God's truth, the devil. If you know we're going to learn about the devil, maybe you would expect a title different than the battle for our minds, right? Maybe some more grand title about overcoming Satan, but we're going to see tonight that our battle with the devil really is a battle for our minds. Uh, We're no longer slaves to sin in Christ. We have been set free, but we still have these old ways of thinking, and uh, the devil likes to feed into that. So the key truth, we're in a spiritual battle. Uh, It's a battle between truth and lies, and it takes place in our minds. If we understand that and we understand the way the devil works, it helps us to stand against the devil's schemes. So we're going to start tonight in Ephesians chapter 6. Oops, jumped ahead. Verse 11, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. All right, last night we learned, or last Sunday we learned, if God gives a truth, the right response is to believe it. If God gives a command, the right response is to obey it. Um, What are we responsible to do in this verse? Put on the armor of God. Why do we need to do that? Okay, give us strength to stand, to protect protect us. We don't often like to talk about it, but what does this verse say? We need to be protected from what? Okay, we're weak and God is the source of our strength. We're in a battle. Right? It says there, the devil has schemes against us. The devil wants to destroy your life. The devil wants to destroy your family. The devil wants to destroy your church. We're in a battle. Think back to what we learned a couple of weeks ago. Why did Jesus come to earth? By the way, we're on page 79 if you're following along in your book. Why did Jesus come to earth? What did we learn? All right, you're jumping ahead of me there, right? A couple weeks ago we learned he came to forgive our sin and to give us life. But in 1 John 3, 8, there's another reason Jesus came. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. What is the devil's work? destruction, right? He came to destroy. He came to destroy us. He came to destroy what God did. And Jesus came to destroy what the devil's trying to do. It's more destruction than we often talk about in church. But there's a continuous theme throughout the Bible. Satan and God in conflict with one another. Where does the devil first appear in the Bible? Which chapter? Genesis chapter 3, right? Adam and Eve are tempted. They eat the fruit. God told them not to eat. In what chapter is Satan last mentioned in the Bible? Revelation, all right, we got the right book. Chapter 20, I think, when Satan is thrown into the lake of burning sulfur. Okay, so from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, there's this conflict. God versus Satan. Christ versus the Antichrist. Truth, the spirit of truth versus the father of lies. The kingdom of light against the kingdom of darkness. But wait a minute, Josh. I'm a believer. I'm a new creation. I'm a child of God. I'm a saint. Doesn't that mean I'm immune to all this? No, it doesn't mean you're immune. It means you're a bullseye. I hate to break it to you. All right, you're a bullseye. Verse 12 of Ephesians 6. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, 
against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Who is Satan's enemy today? According to that verse. What? Every one of us who believes in God is an enemy of Satan. And if you know anything about battle and war, if we're an enemy of Satan, it means Satan is an enemy of ours. Okay? Someone once said, I, I just try to leave Satan alone thinking he'll leave me alone too, but it doesn't work that way. It says right there, our struggle, our battle is not against the people around you. It's against the devil, demonic forces. So if we don't understand this battle, we're likely to be defeated. So it's important, though we often don't take time to learn about Satan, it's important that we understand how he functions and how we can overcome his attacks. And so that's kind of what we're looking at tonight. How does the Bible identify Satan? John 12, verse 31, the prince of this world will be driven out. Ephesians 2, verse 2, the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. 1 John 5, verse 19, the whole world is under the control of the evil one. What do those verses teach you about the devil? All right, he's, he's a ruler in this world. Okay, it's important that we understand this correctly. He would like you to think he kind of stole some of God's power and he now rules over the world, but that's not really what this is talking about. Okay, Satan, in a sense, took Adam's authority, Adam's power. God had given authority to Adam at creation, and when Satan tempted Adam, Adam and Eve and got Adam and Eve to sin, he effectively took Adam's authority and power there from him. And so even Jesus recognized in John 12, the prince of this world, Jesus recognized Satan is influential, has a certain level of control in this world. Jesus doesn't dismiss that. But there's something important we need to learn about Satan. John chapter 1, verse 3. Um, this is context for this verse. The him there is talking about the word. That's Jesus. He was with God in the beginning. He was, um, he was God. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. Through him, all things were made. Through Jesus, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. What does that verse tell you about Satan? He was created by God. Okay, and in the Bible, there's a very distinct line between the creator and everything which was created. We prayed through the Ten Commandments this morning, right? Worship the creator. Don't make an image in the form of anything that's been created. There, there's, a, there's a distinction there. The creator is to be worshiped. The creation is not to be worshipped. Satan is among that which was created. And because of that, he's limited in a number of ways. And we're just going to look at three of them tonight. First way that Satan is limited is here in Job chapter 1. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? And Satan answered the Lord, from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Where is God right now? Everywhere. everywhere, right? He's present everywhere, omnipresent. According to this verse, what was Satan doing? He was Roman, right? He went to Grand Rapids and then down to Kalamazoo and over to Lansing. And what does that show you about Satan? He's free to roam. He can only be in one place at one time. All right? He's a created being. He's limited in the fact he cannot be everywhere at the same time like God is. Now, we looked at Ephesians 6, 12, talked about those rulers and authorities and dominions and powers, right? 
There's a whole network, a whole army of demons that Satan works with. And so it feels like, it appears like Satan's present all over the world at the same time. But the reality is he can only be in one place at one time. He's a finite, limited being. The second way that Satan is limited, Colossians 2 verse 15 And having disarmed the powers and authorities, Jesus made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them at the cross. What happened to Satan's power at the cross? He was disarmed. His power was taken away from him. Jude chapter 1, verse 6, And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their proper dwelling. These God has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. What does that tell you about Satan right now? He's limited, right? He's on a leash. He can't do anything that God doesn't allow him to do. God is all-powerful. Satan, the the ruler of this world, he's limited in his power, right? Even if we go back to the story of Job, he wasn't allowed to do anything to Job that God didn't allow him to do. So he's limited in where he can be, only one place at a time. He's limited in his power, the authority that he has. The third way that Satan is limited is in his knowledge, God has perfect knowledge. What about Satan? Does he know what's going to happen next week? No, right? Does he know what you're thinking right now? No, he can't read your mind. I mean, he can listen to our conversation. He can probably, you know, guess what you're thinking oftentimes, But he can't read your mind. I I use the story in Daniel chapter 2 as kind of proof for this. King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And he woke up in the morning and whether he forgot his dream or he just didn't trust all the, you know, the wise men, the astrologers. And I mean, these were all people involved in occultic activity. Maybe he just didn't trust them to give him a true answer. But he told them, tell me what the dream means. And they're like, yeah, we'll tell you what it means. And then he said... And tell me what I dreamed. And they couldn't do it. Though they were very involved in getting information from evil spirits, occultic activity, they could not figure out what the king's dream was. I use that as proof that the devil can't see what you're thinking. The devil himself didn't know what Nebuchadnezzar had dreamed. And uh, I don't ever recall seeing a headline in a newspaper, psychic wins the lottery, right? The devil doesn't know the future. He doesn't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Oh, sorry. Just looking to see if anybody picked up on that. No, sometimes. Right, when you see someone else yawn, sometimes what do you do? You yawn as well, right? Can the devil put thoughts into your mind? Some say yes, some are nodding no. This is a, Keith is just looking confused. Yeah, he's admitting to that. (laughs) It's a trick question. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. The Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Some people are going to fall away from the church, fall away from the truth because they've been taught things by demons. When a demon goes to teach someone, how does the demon introduce himself? Does he have this cackle-type laugh? Does he stroke his goatee? Or Very subtle, right? He's very subtle. He looks like a teacher, all right? Yeah, I mean, can I put thoughts into your mind? I hope so, or I'm wasting my time up here, right? (laughs) But, 
Yeah, we communicate to one another. We put the thoughts into each other's minds all the time. And, and certainly the devil can use other people to put thoughts into our minds. But can he himself put thoughts into our minds? I'll give you three examples in the Bible. King David, a man after God's own heart, walked with God, loved the Lord, worshipped God, wrote many of our psalms, 1 Chronicles 21. Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to take a census of Israel. What idea came to David's mind? What, what did he want to do? Count your men. Why did he want to count the men? I want to know how big my army is, how much strength I have, okay? Instead of putting his trust in God like he had, all of a sudden he decides, I want to put my trust in my army. And even his commander, Joab, said, David, this is a bad idea. According to David, where did this thought come from? Whose thought did David think it was? He thought it was his own thought. According to the verse, where did the thought come from? From Satan. All right, David thought, this is my idea. The verse clearly says, Satan incited David to do this. Satan put the thought in David's mind, but David thought it was his own idea. There's another example. There's a man named Judas. A man named Judas who had left everything he had to follow Jesus. And he walked with Jesus for three years. He listened to Jesus. He prayed with Jesus. He was one of the, the 12 disciples. And when Jesus sent his 12 disciples out to preach the good news, to heal the sick, to drive out demons, what did Judas do? He went out and he preached the good news and he healed the sick and he drove out demons. And one day a thought comes to Judas's mind. The evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. What thought came to Ju Judas's mind? I can make some money here. Right? 30 pieces of silver, these religious leaders will pay me if I hand Jesus over to them. If you could pause right there and ask Judas, Judas, whose idea is this? What would he answer you? It's my own idea. Right? Judas had watched Jesus cast out demons. Judas himself had probably driven out demons from people. If Judas knew this idea came from Satan, there's no way Judas would have done it. But what does the verse say? Where did this thought come from? The devil had prompted him to do it. It was the devil who put the idea in Judas' mind, but Judas thought it was his own idea. There's another guy a few years later. His name was Ananias. He was a member of the church there in Jerusalem. He sold a field, all right? So let's, let's bring this to East Martin terms. How much is an acre worth around here now? <laughs> Give me a number. $7,000 an acre, all right? So if you sold a 10-acre field, he got seventy-five grand for it. And he had this idea, you know what? I'm just going to keep 5000 and I'm going to bring the other 70000 to the church. It's because we got that special project going on. Now, if someone in this church sold 10 acres and brought $70,000 from that sale to something that was going on here at church, what would you think about that person? It's great, right? It's generous. This person has a heart for the Lord. This person is investing in kingdom investments. Absolutely. That's what we would think. Acts 5, verse 3, Peter said to, say, um, to Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? If you could have asked Ananias, 
you kept five grand and you brought 70,000 to the church and acted as if that was the whole amount. That was the issue. It wasn't that he kept some of it. It's that he was acting as if he was bringing all of it. Ananias, whose idea was that? What would Ananias say? It was his own idea. According to Peter, according to the word of God, whose idea was it? It was Satan's idea. Satan put the thought into Ananias' mind, but Ananias thought it was his own idea. What about you? What about me? I'm useless. I'm ugly. I'm dirty. I'll never change. Those thoughts feel like they're our own thoughts. But maybe, just maybe, they don't come from you. I mean it, right? They don't come from God, I know that. Are they your own ideas or did the devil plant them in your mind? So let's just pause a minute. Not every thought that comes into your head is your own thought. How does that make you feel? A little worried. (laughs) Why? Okay, it feels like we've lost control a little bit, doesn't it? Oh, I need to stop watching so much TV. We'll come back to that. (laughs) What were you going to say, Les? Nothing? Okay. Okay. Somehow it was a little bit of relief. Some of these thoughts aren't actually me. I thought it was my flesh, actually. Well, yeah, maybe. Looking back, is there a point in your life that, that you can now look at something that happened And recognize, you know what, maybe that thought, maybe that idea that I regret wasn't my own idea. Maybe Satan planted an idea in my mind. Doesn't let us off the hook. We still did what we did. But just recognize, man, if he could do that to David... If he could do that to Judas, who had left everything to follow Jesus. If he he could do that to Ananias, who was, I mean, somebody that gave so much money, everybody else thought it was the entire amount. Wow, he could do that to any of us. He's so subtle. subtle. Right. Right. Yep. He can. He can use Christian people who in that moment aren't walking according to the truth. And he knows, he's he's intelligent, right? His, His knowledge is limited, but he's incredibly intelligent. He knows your weaknesses. He knows your tendencies. If we stopped right here, does the devil seem more powerful than you previously thought or less powerful? Okay. Yeah, in some ways, he's less powerful. He's limited. But in other ways, he's more powerful because, wow, he can, he can mess with my thinking in a way I didn't recognize before. All right, so remember, Colossians 2, Jude 1, his power was taken from him. His power is limited today. So he works primarily through three strategies, temptation, accusation, and deception. He tempts you away from what God wants you to be. Look over here. Doesn't this look nice? And it's going to feel good too. And no one needs to know. That's temptation. Then you bite the fruit and he turns on you. Are you joking me? You just failed. Wow. You call yourself a Christian? Huh. You better just go sit somewhere in the back and not say anything. Right. Uh, Revelation chapter 12. Then I heard a voice in heaven 
that said, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of God, of our God and the authority of his Messiah for the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. Satan, first of all, tempts you in the moment you sin, he runs to God to bring accusation against you. And it says he wants to accuse us day and night and night before God. And the third way he works, John 8, 44, um, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees there. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. How does Satan work in that verse? He deceives. Right? He's a liar. He's the father of lies. He says that's his native language. Raise your hands. How many of you were tempted to do something this week you know you shouldn't have done? Anybody tempted here this week? All right, a few of you. I'm not going to ask you if you did it, but... Did any of you hear that voice of condemnation, that accusation this week? Anybody hear that? Have any of you been deceived this week? Only about one person acknowledges that. You see, by, by definition, if you're tempted, you recognize you're being tempted. If you're feeling condemned and accused, you know you're being accused. If you're deceived, you don't recognize you're being deceived because you, by definition, you believe it's true. And so Satan's power was taken away from him at the cross. His primary tool is to work through deception. Last week, we mentioned the caterpillar and the butterfly. We've been made new. We're a new creation. We no longer have to crawl along like a caterpillar. We're free to fly like a butterfly. But if Satan can get you to think you're still a caterpillar, right? if he can get you to think, to believe, your only option is to slog along on your belly like a caterpillar, you're never going to turn away from that. It's only when we learn the truth that we're a butterfly and we're free that we can repent of that old way of thinking. If you've been deceived, how can you become aware of that? What can you do practically to overcome these deceptions that Satan has put into your life? Deceptions, beliefs about who you are, about your value, about how God looks at you. Mm -hmm. All right, ask God, ask the Holy Spirit to show you truth. Good. Someone over here said something. Read your Bible. Learn God's truth. What else? Be in this church. How does that help you? Right? We're not called to be isolated from one another. We're not going to get this all figured out by ourselves. But now we're all aware of this tendency to believe lies about ourselves. And so as we're in conversation with someone and we're speaking out false things about ourselves, derogatory things about ourselves, condemning things about ourselves, Someone else can stop me and say, Josh, that's not true. That's not how God looks at you. You're a new creation. You're a child of God. You're a friend of Christ. You're forgiven. Right? We can remind each other of God's truth. There's another way Satan likes to work. And we're just going to mention it tonight. We're not going to deal with it extensively. There's another lesson that deals much more extensively with this. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, 
He's talking about someone who had um, committed sexual sin, and he said, anyone you forgive, I also forgive, and what I have forgiven, if there's anything to forgive, I've forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. Last week, we looked at Ephesians 4 briefly. When we refuse to forgive someone who has hurt us, it gives the devil a place of influence in our lives. Here again, 2 Corinthians 2. The way to overcome Satan's schemes in this chapter is to forgive the person who needs to be forgiven. So again, it just says, it teaches us that when we refuse to forgive someone, it opens the door for the devil to have influence in our lives. And and I just want to be clear. We're not talking here about being demon-possessed, okay? We read in the Gospels and we see this time and time again where someone is demon-possessed. And the Greek word there doesn't have the same idea that we have about possessed. When we use the word possessed, we're talking about ownership and control, That word actually, maybe demonized would be a better word. The person is significantly influenced by Satan, but the word doesn't mean they're owned by Satan. And that's important for us to remember. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 says, For you know it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. What does that verse tell you about yourself? I'm redeemed, right? Someone, Jesus, paid a high price for me, which means I belong to God, okay? Satan can influence us. He can play with our mind. If we believe his lies, he can gain significant control over us to the extent that we believe his lies. But it doesn't change this fact that God paid the price and we belong to God. Mm. He doesn't care at all. Yeah. If you read the Old Testament, time after time, there was people coming that wanted to destroy the nation of Israel. They wanted to destroy God's people. Even now, that same principle is absolutely true. Satan, I said, you're not immune, you're a bullseye, right? He wants to destroy you because you're one of God's children. And if he could destroy you, he's proven God to be a liar. Absolutely true. Another way Satan works, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4, the God of this age, talking about Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. What does Satan do? When the gospel is preached, what does he do? He blocks the eyes, the minds of people. All right? Sometimes the word of God is taught. The word of God is read in the church. And we get done reading the Bible, and we're like, what did we just read? Anybody ever had that? Right? As he was scattering seeds, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Our psalm this morning was only eight verses. Who of you listened to all eight verses? All right, there's a hand in the back. The fact is, so often when God's word is read, we get distracted. We think about this piece of machinery that needs to be fixed or this issue that our child is facing. And why do those distractions come when God's word is opened? They don't come during the football game. Right? Maybe it's not your own mind bringing the distraction. Maybe it's Satan putting that thought into your mind. We've learned how Satan works. We're going to learn 
our defense, the solution to this issue. But first, we're going to sing a song by one of the great reformers from his perspective about this struggle we have with our enemy, the devil. So let me invite you to stand, and we're going to sing together, um, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. can be seated. So we're on page 86 now in your book, if you're following along, and we're going to talk about our defense against Satan and our defense against the deceptions and the thoughts that he puts into our minds. Some of you might even be kind of freaking out that Satan can put a thought into your mind and you think it's your own thought. How can I tell the difference? The good news is you don't have to tell the difference. And we'll see why in just a minute. So there's five things we can do to defend ourselves against Satan's influence in our lives. Number one is to understand your position in Christ. Ephesians 1, 19 and uh, up to verse 22. What does this tell you about Jesus' position right now? And his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that can be invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church. Amen. What does that tell you about Jesus' position right now? He's got authority. He's above all, right? Far above 
all. So what does that tell you about Satan's position? He's lesser. He's down below, far down below underneath the feet of Jesus. All right? So that's clear. None of us disagree with that. But this text goes on, chapter 2, verse 6, and God has raised us up with Christ and seated us with him, that's Christ, in the heavenly realms, in Christ Jesus. What does that tell you about your position? We're with Christ. So where is Satan compared to you? Far below. Can he do anything to change that? No. Because we're in Christ. However, if he can get you to believe the lie that you're down below, you're going to live and act and think as if you're down below. But the reality is you're seated with Christ. So how do you overcome Satan's influence in your life? First of all, remember your position in Christ. Second thing we need to do is to use the resources that we have in Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5. What has God given us? The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. What has God given to us? Weapons. Weapons to do what? To demolish strongholds. Okay? What are strongholds? Where are strongholds? Right? What does it say in verse 5? Things that set themselves up against the knowledge of God. Where is knowledge? It's in our minds, right? These strongholds are in our minds. They're old lies we have believed. How can we overcome them? What does it say at the end of verse 5? Take those thoughts captive and make them obedient to Christ. All right? That thought comes to your mind. Is it from Satan? Is it from the world? Is it from my TV? Is it from my flesh? Pretty hard to identify. It doesn't matter where it comes from. What are we to do with it? Take it captive. Compare it to God's truth. If it's true, embrace it. If it's not true, right, think of your you got this control tower in your mind and these airplanes of thoughts are wanting to land. You, you can't really stop a thought from coming, but you can stop it from taking root. Right? You can, in a sense, send it on its way. Aren't we indwelt by the Holy Spirit and shouldn't he guide us? Yes and yes. But Romans 12 told us, be transformed through the renewing of your mind. What are we responsible to do in that verse? Renew our mind. Here it says, take every thought captive. Who's responsible to do that? I am. So absolutely the Holy Spirit will help us. And the more you ask him to help you, the more he will help you. He delights to help you. But we still have a responsibility to take control of our thought life. So it doesn't matter where the thought came from. We still need to recognize, is this thought according to God's truth or is there somehow deception in this thought? So what practical steps can you do to take your thoughts captive? 
Pray about it. Garbage in, garbage out, right? So if you don't want the garbage in there, then don't allow the garbage to go in there. Yes. Right. Yeah. One of the images we often use in Uganda, because there very few people own their own vehicles, so people use public transportation. So almost everywhere they go, they're a passenger and someone else is the driver. So we ask the question, in your own thoughts, are you the driver or are you a passenger? Are you taking your thoughts where they should go or are you sitting kind of idly as a passenger just allowing your brain to think about whatever comes to your mind? God wants us to be the driver of our minds. He doesn't want us to be an idle passenger just thinking about anything that comes to our minds. And if we recognize we've got these old ways of thinking, we've got some pretty unhealthy ways of thinking, how can we overcome them? Look at what James 4 tells us. Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and what's going to happen? He will flee away. You don't even have to yell at him to go away, right? You don't have to chase him away. You resist him, he's going to go away. This gets us into, we talked about renouncing, I don't know if it was last week or the week before, making a declaration that I reject these old beliefs I've been having. Um, We're going to do the steps to freedom in a couple weeks, and this is part of this process of submitting to God and resisting the devil. And if I can just be really frank with all of you, having lived and served and ministered here in Michigan and also in Africa, Western Christians are pretty good at submitting to God. But we're not very good at resisting the devil. African Christians are very intentional about resisting the devil, but not as good about submitting to God. That's just been my experience in the locations where I've been. But we need to do both. And so if one of them comes easily and naturally, submitting to God, great. If one of them is kind of new to us, resisting the devil, we can learn more to do that. It doesn't mean we can't learn. It just doesn't come as naturally. But we're going to go through that, um, like I said, in just a couple weeks. The third thing, so the first one was remember your position in Christ. The second one, use the resources God has given to you. The third one is don't be frightened. The only power Satan has over you is the power you give him by believing his deceptions. His power was taken away from him at the cross. You're seated with Christ in the highest place in Christ. He knows that. You don't have to be afraid. 1 John 5, 18, the end of the verse says, the one who was born of God, that's Jesus, keeps God's people safe, and the evil one cannot harm them. We don't need to fear the devil. There's another thing that's all around us that we cannot see that can cause a lot of death and sickness and pain It's called germs, right? Not too many of you came in here really afraid of germs tonight. The devil's kind of the same way, right? Demons are present. They're active. They want to harm us, but we don't need to be afraid of them, just like we don't need to be afraid of germs. The fourth thing we need to do, guard your mind, This verse is for the next one. Guard your mind. Mary said, I need to watch what I, take care of what I watch on TV, right? Take care of what you listen to on the radio. Take care of the conversations that you have. Take care of what you view on the internet, right? When we put that kind of junk into our mind, it will affect our thinking, If we don't want Satan to have influence in our mind, we need to guard what we put into our minds. And the last one is turn on the light. If 
you want to overcome Satan's influence in your life, turn on the light. It's not so important where a thought came from. The real issue is, is it true? If you go into a dark room, how do you get rid of the darkness? Turn on the light, right? You hit the switch, the light appears, and the darkness is gone. So we don't need to focus on the enemy. We don't need to focus on the lie. We've got to focus on the truth. When we fix our mind on what is true, the lie, the deception, the influence of the enemy is greatly diminished. Philippians 4.8, and this verse has been really revolutionary in my life, all right? Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, lovely, admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. What's the command word in that verse? Think. Right? Think. What are you going to allow your mind to focus on and think about? You're responsible for that. God doesn't give us a command that's impossible for us to do. He fully expects us to do this. So often when we're in a situation and we don't know how it's going to end, we start to worry, right? What if this happens? What if that, I mean, just take my own family's example. What if we're not able to go back to Uganda? What will happen to the ministry there? What will happen to our kids? What will happen to, right? Is that stuff true? No, no. Because we may go back. Like, we don't know what the future, but we're, we're focusing all that mental energy on something that may or may not even be true. Right? So when you enter these hard times, focus on what is really true, not what might happen. As you view yourself and the beliefs you have about yourself, focus on what is true. Think about what is good, what is noble, what is pure, what is lovely. Focus your mind on those things. And some of you think, man, that's too hard. Anybody like pizza? What do you like on your pizza? Everything, <laughs> right? Bacon and onions and more bacon and mushrooms. What are you thinking about right now? Pizza, right? See, it's not that hard. It's not that hard. We just have to have the awareness that we need to do it and the determination to do it. I, one time, I mean, I've heard this story many times. How do they teach bank tellers to identify counterfeit bills? It's not by teaching the different types of counterfeit. It's by teaching them what a real bill looks like, right? A real $100 bill or $50 bill or whatever. I was in Nigeria one time, and that was a cash-only society, and their biggest bill was worth 20 bucks. So if you wanted to buy a car, you had to have a whole pile of money, right? And so, I mean, people would package their money in wads of 100 bills, and you put it through your, over your finger, and you can use the thumb and the other fingers to count very quickly. And so... We had visitors who needed cash. We took a few hundred bucks to this guy on the sidewalk because, you know, it, it was Nigeria at the time. It's probably a little better now, but where do you get cash? Oh, it's from the guy in the long robe over there, all right? So he's going to be the exchange bureau, and he has a wad of 100 bills in his hand, and he counts that money in seconds, hands it over. I happened to be in line one time, and somebody else was bringing him local currency and wanted American dollars. And so he was counting the money the other guy handed to him. And they were talking as he was counting, and he stopped right in the middle. And he pulled one out. He wasn't even looking at it. He could just feel it by his fingertips. He said, this one's a fake. He knew what the truth was so well. The moment he felt a lie, he recognized it as a lie. God calls us to think about what is true. And the more we do that, the more easily we'll recognize what a lie is. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Father in heaven,
we give you praise because you have given us victory over our enemy, the devil. Lord, you have raised us up with Christ and seated us in a position far above that which Satan has. But Lord, honestly, too many times we've believed lies, we've thought lies, we've been undiscerning in the thoughts that come into our minds and in the thoughts we put in our minds. And we've sat idly as a passenger as our brain just whirls this way and that way instead of taking control of our thought life. Lord, help us to take our thoughts captive and to make them obedient to Christ. Lord, help us to use the position we have to walk in victory every day. Lord, help us to walk in your truth, to think what is true, to think what is noble, what is right, what is excellent, pure, and praiseworthy. Lord, help us to win the battle for our minds. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to have a short video right now uh, of a testimony of someone that also learned this kind of freedom. You know, I've never thought of myself as a particularly uh, bound person. I, I would not have identified uh, major vices or debilitating thoughts. I would have thought I was a pretty middle of the road. You know, I'm sure there's more freedom to be had, but it's not like I'm stuck in, off in a ditch or something like that. Uh, you know, but one thing I would often talk about is how odd it was that when I would go to be still, when I would go to be silent, when I would go to pray or to meditate, read the scriptures, it was like the volume in my mind would turn up to 11. It was like all the thoughts from yesterday, worries about tomorrow, my schedule, things I had not yet done, all just came rushing into my mind. And it's not like it was there all the time. It was particularly when I would slow down. I always thought that was just because, well, I'm, I'm actually being quiet, and so that's just kind of naturally what happens in your mind. I never would have thought it actually had something to do with freedom. So there was a, a particular time that I was actually exposed to the steps of freedom in Christ. And I thought, well, this will be great. Everyone can use more freedom. Uh, and I remember and before um, I, in the class that uh, actually got into the material in the very beginning of it, they, uh, the, the facilitator invited us to just be quiet for a couple minutes and, and not think about anything in particular, just to be quiet. So I remember, you know, me and everybody else, we closed our eyes and, and as I was used to, you know, I became immediately distracted and thinking about a million other things like, you know, a, a very busy highway in my mind. And afterwards, the facilitator said, you know, how was that, how was that for you? Was that, was that quiet? Was it noisy? Did you start thinking about everything else, you know, that you have to do later today or next week? And well, I thought, of, well, of course, it was not quiet. I started thinking about a million things. And, and then we just progressed into the steps of freedom in Christ. I remember at the end, after moving through each, each step in that course, uh, they invited us to do the exact same thing. And they didn't prompt us. They didn't say, notice how different it is. They didn't say anything. They just said the same invitation, just to invite you to be quiet and still in your mind for two minutes. And I remember lowering my head and closing my eyes and, and just silence, just absolute silence. And I could have one thought and dwell on it. I could say one prayer and let it resonate. It was incredible. I, I had never experienced anything like it. I didn't know it was available. I, I, I thought this was just human nature at work. I didn't know it had anything to do with my freedom. So we as a group are going to go through the Steps to Freedom on Sunday, November 7, um, at 2.30. So last week you filled out the paper. Um, everybody but three could do Sunday. So we're going to be planned from 2.30, takes a few hours, um, and then we'll have some sort of a meal together afterwards. Um, if you're one of those three people who could not come on Sunday, please let me know, and we will find another time um, to do that. If the three of you all are able to connect with me, maybe that Saturday, the 6th, we could do it. Um, but it, 
it's such an important part of this journey toward discipleship together. Let's stand together and sing our closing song, but before we do that, I want to give you a closing blessing. So you can stand. Actually, we've got a couple songs yet, don't we? I'm getting all confused here. Be strong in the Lord. That's where we're at, right? All right, let's sing that together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit is with you now and will be forever. Amen. Let's close tonight with a song, I Surrender All.